think you've got to kind of know that you're willing to play the game. You can't have a slice of the cake and not take on the rest of it. Go out there knowing how you want your brand to be in five years time, what your goal is with your brand, because you are playing with fire. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycox Show, where today we're trying a new segment, which we're gonna call Success in the Spotlight. And this is gonna be a new series of interviews and podcasts, where I'm gonna be meeting and interviewing famous names, faces and celebrities from all kinds of industries to hear their stories, how they made it, what they've learnt, and how they managed to achieve and sustain success in the spotlight. So our first guest, I'm very excited to say, is Suzanne Shaw. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank now, you. just a little bit of background to, to background to Suzanne. And it shows, I don't know if I'm getting older, it shows how, how time quickly is passing. But Suzanne was launched into the spotlight in 2001 by winning a place in the pop group Hearsay via the ITV smash series Pop Stars. And at just 18 years old when she auditioned, Suzanne won over the judges in the nation to, to be seen by 12.6 million people oh. uh, who, who, tuned in, who tuned in to see the final five band members being announced yeah. um so um yeah hearsay went on to sell three million records worldwide scored two number one uk singles uh before disbanding 18 months later yeah um i mean i, I, can't, I can't believe that was literally 20 years ago i mean we were just saying, saying before we started recording um it will be 20 years in march 2021 when we release pure and simple it's crazy i mean does it feel like 20 years ago yes and no it does feel like um no, yeah, it does feel like 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. A lot's happened in between. So, yeah, you, you just don't want to admit like it. You, time, when, no. when, when you say something feels like yesterday, then, <laughs> then, then, then you know you're getting old. But Yeah, um, yeah no, it's crazy um, how, what a huge success it was. And it, it's funny, really, because it was the very first TV show of its kind. So nobody knew how well this TV show would do. You know, it might not have been watched by anybody. People might not have... Uh, been interested in it it would have had no viewing figures whatsoever so therefore we might have not ended up going ahead with the record deal so it was the very first time the format was done so, done so everybody was um trying it out it was we were guinea pigs really. and how, how did it come about for you i mean what, what were you doing at the time how, how did you kind of audition to get on the show oh it's funny because at the time i was well i was 18 years old um, and from the age of nine, I've had an agent. So it was a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a child star. I'd done a few TV bits and pieces, done a lot of musical theatre. Um, so I had an agent. Um, at the time, I was auditioning for Maria in Coronation Street. I was auditioning for a Robson Green drama and Godspell, the Tory musical. Um, and I would be up for auditions all the time. Um, but I was also in my part time job, I was in an Apple tribute band. So I was filming, um, but I was also <laughs> dating the guy who ran the band um, and I was in the band and on one of the days he dumped me and fired me. So I opened the papers to, uh, it was called Stage Magazine. I don't know whether you've ever I, heard I do. Of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, used, I, used to, I used to do a bit of acting myself back in Did the day. Did you? Oh, also... we'll talk about that yeah. in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I opened up and it said, do you want to be a pop star? And I was like, yeah, do you know what? I'm going to show him. I, yeah, I do want to be a pop star. Um, so, and a friend of mine um, wanted to go to the audition and she also wanted a lift because I had a car. Um, I inherited uh, my granddad's car, which was a Ford Orion, a white Ford Orion. So, um, so yeah, in the morning, um, I had to get up mega early because well, with inheriting the car, I had to take my nan uh, to do her chores before I did anything in my day. Was that the deal? Yeah, it was the deal, yeah. Um, so I had to get up and go to Berry Market at like six in the morning, drop my nan off, go to Granada Studios where they were doing the auditions and queue up with my friend. Um, got through to the auditions, uh, did the first round and they said, oh, can you stay for the next round? And I thought, shit, my nan's at Berry Market, I need to pick her up. <laughs> Um, so I rang my uncle off a payphone because I didn't have a mobile <laughs> and um, said, yeah, can, can you pick uh, my nan up because I've, I've got through to the auditions. Um, so, yeah, went through to the next round um, and then I got through to the next round. My friend got cut, who I took to the auditions. And then at the time I was like, how do I tell my agent this? Because I'm now down to the finals for Coronation Street. I'm down to the finals for this Robson Green drama and down to the finals for um, Godspell. But what if I get down to the finals for, for the you know, being in a pop band? You know, they're going to make me a pop star, put me in a house in London. That is like really cool. Um, so 
Anyway. Was, was that the one you wanted? Was that what you'd have preferred out of all four of them? To be honest, I don't know. I probably would have gone with Coronation Street because it was such a big show. Uh, but obviously, Samia got the role. But the other person who was down to the finals of um, Maria for Coronation Street was Kimberly Walsh. Okay. So, um, me, Samia, Kimberly Walsh, and Sheridan Smith used to be always up for the same parts. Northern girls going up for the same roles, um, and one of us would get one or the other. I was up for two pints of lager and a packet of crisps as well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I didn't get that. I didn't get the Robson Green drama, and I didn't get into Godspell, but I got into Hearsay, so it was the decision was made for me. Um, and, and, and so when you won the auditions to get onto the show, how, how many people actually started the show? Because presumably it was all... So we, yeah. we as the public saw you, saw you guys all auditioning and then getting down to yeah. the fans and stuff, but you'd already had to audition prior to that, hadn't you? Yeah, so um, it was thousands, thousands of people queuing up um, to audition for it. Um, to be honest, like any of the shows back then, anything that was in the stage, it was a real old school queue up outside, you know, not, not as much as it is now, not tens of thousands, only a few thousand. Um, but yeah, it was uh, like if you go up for a, a musical, that was an open audition. You know, there'd be queues down the street outside the theatre. Um, but it was just so bizarre because normally when you go up for an audition, you would be in a, a room with a judging panel and that would be it. With this, you're in a room full of um, a room full of all the other contestants with cameras and a judging panel. So the nerves were like so much higher because you, was, you were being watched by everybody. And, and were they, I guess, did, did they tell you what to expect? Were they, were they, were they coaching you as you went along? Um, I remember sat there and Nigel Lithgow said... Naughty Nigel. Remember? Nasty Nigel. Uh. Nasty Nigel, <laughs> yeah. He, um, he said, uh, there's going to be five winners, um, whether it be five girls, five boys or a band of uh, girls and boys um, you'll move to London um, you'll have a record deal you'll live in a house um, and I just remember th sitting there and I remember thinking what lucky five people they are going to be that sounds amazing never in a million years did I imagine myself being in a pop band and I think that was just purely because um, I was doing a lot of musical theatre and TV so that was what it was in my head as a destiny. Um, so sat there, I kind of just went along to the auditions to get back at the person who just sacked me and to, to take my mate. Um, so I didn't ever think I was going to be in the band. Um, and as we were continuing to go down and down, um, it was a little bit more like, oh my God, this is going to be real. Um, and then they came over to my nan's house to tell me that I got into the band. And I just thought, Oh my God, like all, all my dreams have absolutely come true overnight. I'm moving to London. I'm going to be in a band and I'm gonna, I've just been given a £1 million record deal. And what did it feel like, you know, when they came to your house to tell you? Was it, was it mass elation? Was it relief? Was it, did, did, was it like a novelty that then kind of wore off a bit? Or, 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 or you know, did you feel like you were living on a cloud for weeks? Oh, it was just insane. I think... Um, I think I was really nervous. I was always given the option to go to stage school as a kid, go to London, go to stage school. But I always said no because I didn't want to leave home. So I was really quite scared leaving home and parents and, and kind of going out into the big bad world myself. Um, but yeah, so I think I was really quite nervous. I was in, you know, a band with four other very char charismatic people um, with big opinions, big personalities. So I, and because I was the youngest in the band, I always felt a little bit intimidated by that. Um, but, you know, we moved down, we're all in it together. You know, you get used to living with each other and you just overnight become a pop star, like literally overnight. There was no kind of growth like the Spice Girls had or Take That had or Atomic Kitten where they would gradually build, um, get developed over years, then they'll start releasing, you'd work your way up the charts. We were together, we were clothed, make up hair, you know, overnight. Um, you know, the first single went out there, had the biggest sell sales and, and went to number one. There was no 
creeping our way up and getting used to it, it was literally overnight success. Did you get much say in any of the things that went on or, 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 or was it all very kind of, um, I guess, fabricated for you? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, very, very little say. It was you, you kind of turned up to work, you were told what to wear, yeah. told what you'd be singing. Yeah, um, you'd have your options of what you would, you was going to wear. Um, first come, first served. So, you know, all of us girls had just kind of rushed to the rail. Um, I tend to get mine last. So I was left with the, the leftover bits and pieces. Like, oh, I wanted to wear what Mylene wore or Kim wore. Um, but yeah, you, it, we were very much manufactured. I think the only thing that was a standout for us is that we always said we would sing live. We would never mime. Majority of the time we sang live. But therefore, some of our performances were really dodgy because <laughs> in studios, the sound equipment wasn't set up for you to be able to sing live. You know, the feedback would be terrible. You couldn't hear yourself. So you weren't really finding your notes. So it was like after a while of them <laughs> saying, we told you, you really shouldn't have sang live on this show. We're not equipped for it. We were like, ah, right, we get it. <laughs> yeah, let's mime then. So, so, so when you were, so you, you got, you got told, um, uh, you got told at your grand's house, house that you got it. You, know, you, yeah. you, you moved to the house in London. I mean, at, w at what point did you kind of get chance to have, you know, to kind of have a, and I've made it moment, you know, was there, was there a, a big purchase or, or, or you know, did, did you ever get to really kind of indulge and enjoy it or were you, you straight on the working treadmill? Um, I remember my accountant saying, I, I remember saying to my accountant, when we set up our limited companies, which at the time I didn't know anything about, I didn't know how it worked, I didn't know much about tax. I didn't know what the process of buying a house was or any of these things. I just took for granted my accountant would just look after everything. So when I sat down with her and I said, am I able to buy, I really want to get a camcorder because I wanted to <laughs> film behind the scenes and a laptop. Can I afford that? You know, I'm going from something that I was, I was earning like 68 pound a week in um, my Abbey Tribute Band. Um, so I remember thinking, Oh, do you know, I really hope I could earn that. I didn't have no idea what was in my bank account. And she just looked at me and, and laughed. It was the worst thing she could have done because then I just thought, I must have loads of money in there. And I was And like, you went wild. <laughs> like that, just went absolutely wild. At one point she said, you've spent 20,000 pounds on clothes in eight months. And I was like, go, let's carry on. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and did, you, did, you, did you think it would never end? Did, 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 you, did you appreciate what you were selling? No. Not selling, what you were making? And I guess, do you, do you regret spending, spending looking back? Yeah, massively. I regret not being educated or educating myself on how business works massively because, um, you know, like I said, you know, I didn't know much about how the tax worked. I didn't even know how much, uh, you know, my limited company worked. I had it for years before I figured out exactly how that worked. Um, so, you know, I think words like saying, yes, you can afford a computer and a laptop and um, the manager saying that um, I can retire, we, you know, as a band, if it carries on like this, um, you'll be able to retire in five years. The words like that, I just assumed I had, it was coming out of our eyeballs, you know, this money. It, but they, you know, the, you had ITV that was taking 40% of our wages, you had management that was taking 20%, and then the rest was split five ways. Right. So it wasn't actually that much. So what we actually earned as a band was huge. Um, but, you know, we, you know, we didn't actually get a massive piece of the pie. And when when you read about um, you know uh, uh, pop stars or, or uh, you know rock bands and stuff in, in in the press when when you look at uh, articles where they've you know spent a load of money or or, mm. or, or, or lost money there there always seems to be um, reference to the kind of misconception that you know when when you get a record advance yeah. it's not it's not kind of really your money it's it, it, it's, no. it's almost like it's like a loan and then and you at, at the end of each year um, all, all the things that you think were provided for you in that year you, you know the hotels that you've been to the cars that you've been sent you, you you suddenly get a bill for all of these is, yeah. is, is, is that how how it works then? yeah very much so so you say you're given a million pound that million pound is to pay for everything that you do to promote that single to make it to you know, everything that comes with that and then whatever is left over you get that after commission okay um 
And, and like, you, when you guys got, so you guys got a, a million pound record contract, mm -hmm. which was effectively, so that was a million pounds to, to launch a record, promote the record, and then what was left is yours, but then split five ways. Yeah, right. and then 40% went to ITV, who owned us as a band, okay. and then 20% went to our manager, and then it was split five ways. So yeah, we kind of came out with £2.50, <laughs> <laughs> so not much at all. Um, but then there were things on side of that that you earn, brand deals. Um, one of the biggest money earners for us was our merchandise on our UK tour. Um, you know, you do your OK shoots, you do, uh, you know, separate things um, that you, you gain as much money for as you can along the way. Um, but yeah, that million pound when you're saying, why have I got that car turning up? I want a better car than that. Silly. No, ha get the fucking tube. <laughs> Don't even get a car. Um, and I remember quite early on, um, our um, manager, uh, our tour manager saying, you know, you're better off not spending this money on cars because you do know you're, you're running you're out. Yeah. So therefore I would get the tube, but then the other band members or another one band member wouldn't. So they'd be going in luxury. That was coming out of our pot. And coming out of your mutual pot. Yeah. So therefore you're like, well, it's either we all do it together or we all don't. Um, and then that's when, you, you know, the tension starts. Um, not that we that massively happened in our band, but, you know, you can see how it happens when, you know, one wants to spend more money than the other. So, t so tell me, I mean, social media never, ex never existed no. when, um, w w when you were first getting famous. And I guess as someone who's, who's had a career that's, that's lasted the last 20 years and, you know, you, you've now seen life, life with social media, li life yeah. without it. I mean, do, do, you, do you look back and think that, that you wish it was around when, when Hearsay was on? Because I guess it, it would have given you an even bigger profile, yeah. even quicker. Or, or was it probably a blessing that you, that you got less shit from people yeah there. i think um in terms of finances uh financial aspects you probably would wish it was around because i think there's more um scope in earning money with social media um, but in terms of mental health no i'm glad it wasn't around i think i remember there was lots of forums and websites um when the band released i remember one comment saying that i had a peg leg and was from a farm and i remember being like Somebody says I've got a false leg. <laughs> and I thought, Christ, if that was today with social media, <laughs> oh my God, I'd be devastated. But no, with the trolling that goes on, um, I, I, I think it's quite concerning. Um, but, you know, from the other aspect, you know, if I would want to start a side business from, you know, hearsay and was a little bit more savvy with the business, I probably would look to do that with the fact that you had social media. Oh, at what point in your career do you, th do you think you really started to kind of attune to the business side of things and think, you know what, I, 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 need, to, I need to learn more, I need, I need to absorb probably more? Probably only just recently. <laughs> today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> today. Today, after speaking to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I think that has been my failure, is not having the confidence to sell myself. I think, for me, I always wanted to... I didn't really look at myself as my business, as my brand. And I think it's only recently I've gone, hold on, you know, if I want to really do well in this game, I can't... I've got to be able to sell myself. And that is really tough really tough to be able to um, go out and sell yourself it's all right if you know I'm selling that bottle of water um, you know you, you can brag about it as much as you want but to be able to do that about yourself um, is, is a lot I find it personally quite hard and it's stuff like that you know you've got to be able to be the forefront of your business and be able to push yourself out there um, to get as much um, revenue and, and, and attention. So talk to me about life after hearsay, because I guess whilst that was, you know, su such a, it will always be such a massive, massive mm. part, of, part of your career, uh, I guess it, it was probably only for, for some of the shortest period as well. I mean, you, yeah. you, you've, you've been doing things for, what, 17 or 18 years you know, p post hearsay. Yeah, um, yeah, a really short uh, space of time. Um, after hearsay, um, I pretty much went straight into work. I didn't want to think about it all too much. And, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, all of this happened. I think you said before, at what point did you sit back and think... I've made it. I've made it. And I didn't have time to in the band. And it wasn't until after it all stopped and gone. It was like, what happens now? 
where you know nobody was to be seen no management no record company you know my tour manager who looked after us so much he's he's not there anymore you know this is the person who knows how to get me a doctor's appointment I've moved to London knowing my very doctor's doctor's surgery really well to not having one down in I'm like what did we do did who was our doctor um so it's really things small things like that not knowing what what how to actually function as a human being after coming out of a pop pop band because you're working so hard everything gets done for you because you are just the character in the band that you know has to go on perform come off and then go into the next gig and perform so everything behind the scenes is done for you so getting my head around that was quite tough um obviously i had my family were up north my my true friends my real friends um were all up north so it was kind of getting my head around what what I was going to do next so I threw myself into what I knew best which was musical theatre which was my first love so I went straight into a touring musical and I remember being petrified going on stage because my last experience of going on stage was the demise of the band where we were getting booed every time we went out so I just assumed that we, I was going to get booed when I went out on stage, and I was. This is why you love pantomime, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I was like, <laughs> give me the baggy roll. I know that feeling very, very well. Um, yeah, so I, um, I was petrified. Um, I didn't know, um, you know, whether, uh, I, yeah, I was going to get booed. And I, I remember saying to one of the other cast members, "What if they boo me?" And they laughed and they were like. Darling, this is musical theatre. Nobody <laughs> boos you in musical theatre unless you're in pantomime. Um, and then I very I got to grips very quickly on what a wonderful industry that is. Um, but also doing deals going into the show, um, you know, I didn't know what was kind of the going rate. My agent um, broke the deal when my manager did. Um, and then it was like, now I, I don't need a music manager. I need a theatre agent, a TV agent. Um, so I very quickly went back to my old agency um, that I was with before I got into Hearsay. So yeah, I went into musical theatre um, and you know started to grow a career with that and did some fantastic shows. And then before you know it, I was back on TV doing doing my next reality stint, which was um, Dancing on Ice. Uh, and and how how much of it was how much of your journey was planned out insofar as uh, like you, you went back into musical theatre because because that was your that was your love. But you know, but did you kind of did you have a plan in place that you know this is what yeah. I'm going to do next, or was it just really you know I keep getting my name out there and see see what work comes yeah. along? Yeah, no, definitely it was very much that it was just keep getting my name up there and see what work came along. There was no planning and I and I think there I think for me looking back I felt like maybe I should have had more of a strategy one thing that I've learned along the way I always thought you know you have a manager they create it for you they can see it they can see your vision but they can't no one can but yourself and that's the biggest mistake that I made was allowing my destiny to be in the hands of other people who couldn't see it the way I saw it so it was always jarring um, so every time that I went for something, a manager might think, well, you know, I think you should be going more down that route and let's get you back on the front of the papers and let's make you, you know, you're going to have a breakdown in a month's time because that's what's going to get, and it's not what I wanted. And sometimes I would let that happen because I thought that was the best thing to do in terms of keeping me out there and keeping the work coming in. Um, and I feel like the biggest mistake I've made in business is not doing it and taking control of it myself um so yeah i kind of flitted from one job to the next um doing dance and nice is something most certainly that i wanted to do you know that's kind of doing those tv shows is fantastic where you get to learn a, a skill that you never thought you could do um, but also it gives you the opportunity to build your brand to then go on to more jobs yeah. in musical theatre that I wanted to do, like doing Chicago. I doubt I would, it would have taken me a lot longer to land that role um, if I hadn't have been on Dancing on Ice and, and won the show. Have you been in Greece? No, so that, I've not. So, so, I've auditioned for it, but I've never, yeah, I never got I it. I must have seen Greece literally 30 times. So, really? so, so my, so my musical theatre story is that uh, when, when, when I was a kid, I, you know, I used to, used to do a little bit of acting, you know. Uh, uh, being Tell the, me all about this. <laughs> is that what you wanted to do? So, so what I really wanted to, so, so uh, 
I, I, I did act. I, I enjoyed acting. I, I'd, I'd done some some tiny little bit part, you know, some tiny little bit parts, and and, and a couple and a couple of um, bits in theatre, as yeah. in you know, like, like pro proper theatre, not not the school play. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in my head, I I always wanted to be Danny in Greece. Yeah. But my big problem was I can't sing for sure. I mean, when I say I can't sing, everyone always goes, oh, I can't really sing, and you know, they go, oh, I mean, my voice is diabolical, and um, I, I, but I found that found the singing tutor. Yeah. This shows shows how long, how long ago this is now. So, it, this must have been in, in the early nineties. Um, mm. And I, I used to she was lived about three miles, two miles from where I live with my parents. I used to ride my bike over there to go to go and to go and have singing lessons. And <laughs> and and this well, I forget what her name was, but she used, she used to have a big um, big grand piano in her room. Yeah. And you had to, you had to stand there. She would play the piano, and you know you you do you do your singing with her. And she um, and and you had to sing, record it on a tape, uh, yeah. and then t take the tape and that. That was your that was your practice. You, know, you had to had to listen to the tape and then all, yeah. you know, pretty, you know, practice of stuff. And we used to do this. I can remember it to this day. The song that we used to practice was "Only Fools Rush In." You know, um, wise men say only fools rush in. You know, sing it for us. Oh, do me a favour. <laughs> <laughs> you know the Elvis song, yeah. Yeah. And. The tape was, it just sounded like nothing you've ever heard. I couldn't even listen, I couldn't even listen to this tape myself. It was so <laughs> bad, I couldn't play it to practice. And <laughs> after four or five times of going back to this woman, even she looked at me and said, I, I can't listen to you. <laughs> I can't. Oh, God. I can't listen to you sing. So that was that was the end of my Danny Zuko dreams. Oh, I, just, I, just, I, had, I had to stick to I had to stick to non -sing, non singing acting. Oh, that's a shame. So oh. things could have been so different. I could, I could have been the, the the sixth member of here. So you could have been. You could have been. <laughs> my son um, can't sing. My eldest son. Uh, well, I, I think he'll be able to eventually. But yeah, we, I was I always wondered why. I put, put him I mean, is, is it something that you you kind of born born with, or I mean, how, how much of it can you learn? Like that, as I in, think, I think is everyone born with, with some kind of tubes, and then and then you kind of do your practicing to get better. I mean, I just don't don't think anyone could ever take my my voice and do anything I with think, it. I think I think that it's what you can hear. If you can't hear where to place the note, then there is very little teaching you can do. I think you know, there's lots of amazing singers out there. So unless you I've got a fantastic natural ability, and then you learn how to really use your instrument. Um, I think it's just not. Don't just don't bother. I was in, you I, should be having a really <laughs> tough time out there. I, I was I was in Spain over Christmas, and uh, I'd, I'd I'd met with a girl over there, and she was she was there with her. I mean, she was a single mom, so she was out there, there with her two young kids and, and her parents. And we've been out for a couple of drinks, and one night she she invites me over to um, over to where her and her family are staying to, to to have some dinner and go to the local karaoke bar. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so we've we've had dinner. I'm, I've, I've had a few a few drinks, and she says, "Let's go and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll all go and uh, get a couple of drinks and go to this karaoke bar." So she goes, "Oh, you know, we we love it as a family, and you, you'll you'll have to do a duet with us." I'm thinking, "You really don't want to hear my singing, but yeah, obviously I, I don't I don't want to let myself let myself down in front in front in front of this girl." And um, I've gone to the toilet. When I've come back, she's on the stage doing a du doing a duet with her dad, and they were they were both fantastic. And then she comes off the stage. I said, "I said, what are you doing?" I thought we were supposed to we were supposed to be doing the duet together. She goes, "No, no, I've I've, I've put your name down. You're doing the next song on your own." I says, "No, I bloody am not." She <laughs> she goes, "No, no, it's it, it's fine. That you know they're expecting you." And the DJ, you know, he's like with the DJ who sings yeah. a bit himself, and he, so he comes over. He goes, "Oh, you're, you're Matt, yeah?" I says, "Yeah." He goes, "Right, we've got you up next. You're singing Robbie Williams' Angels." <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, <laughs> can, you know. Can, 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 can you think of, of them. Can oh you think of the worst song? I said, no, really, I'm not, Matt. I can't, I can't. And they were going, come on, Matt, you're doing it, you're doing it. I thought, I, I can't, I can't not sing in front of this girl now. So I've, I've, I've gone up and stood on stage. And I said to the I've said to the DJ, I said, Matt, I said, I know everyone says it, but my singing is shocking. I says, I'll do it. We, like, you come and help me. Let's let, let's let's do it together. So, so so me and this guy stand in the middle of this totally cheesy karaoke bar in bar in Marbella, and the you know the the words start coming up for, for for Robert Williams, and I'm singing, and he starts off with me, and he stops, just leaving me singing on my own. And I mean, they were boo they were booing, they were shouting, and I, I, I did I did the whole song. Came off stage, must have been the most uncomfortable four minutes of my life oh my and, God. Um, and and, and this, this girl said she goes you know your singing was terrible and I've, I've never seen someone stand up there with just so much confidence with such a with such a <laughs> terrible ter terrible voice but well <laughs> well done for doing it anyway oh my god well that's it that's that's what it's all about it's confidence 
you go in and believe in yourself, then, you know, at least. <laughs> I think, I think, that, I think, I think there's going to be a, a, a slight degree of ability. <laughs> but I guess to, 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 talking in all seriousness, again, about uh, ability and getting better and mm. confidence, etc. One, one of the things I, t I talk a lot about, um, both in my videos and podcasts, is, is, is about mentors and and, uh, and, and mentorship and, and yeah. how it's something that I I feel that I probably learned about learned about too late in life. Well, not too late, but you know, l l yeah. later than I would have liked. And I guess one of the big things that we see as the public with shows like you know, like Pop Stars and uh, and, and uh, X Factor and, mm. and those shows is that the um, the, the the bands or the individuals you know get get mentored by the by these in, by these industry industry greats now I mean, how, how much when you're actually in the business how much of that is just for show or, or how much do you actually you know re, mm. really get mentored by people and, and you know have, have you got people that you would have considered mentors back in the day or or, or, or that you that you look up to now or you know yeah. people that you've got you go to for advice yeah um oh god I mean I think I think it was, it's a hard one with uh, my time in the band because in terms of mentors, um, they it was a first for everybody. So nobody really knew how it was going to end. Um, so I think, you know, they were going for, you'd have the people who were in the music industry who were going for a normal music situation for what they've done with bands before, a normal format, but it was a very different format. We were more of a story than a pop band so we we're more of a soap opera so because we were from a reality tv the media therefore wanted to know our backstory where we were from and it became less about our music <clears throat> so it was really difficult for people to know how to mentor us and how to handle this because it was new for everyone um, going back in the day, I had some fantastic mentors in my, you know, dancing, my agent, my very first agent. Um, and, um, you know, my drama teacher at school was a brilliant mentor. Um, and then as I kind of gone along, I think because my trust issues have been beaten, um, you know, to the ground with people selling stories feeling like managers have actually just used us to make money and not actually looked after our well-being. I've really struggled wanting to kind of develop any relationship of what a mentor could do for me because I don't really trust very easily. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to um, giving a little bit of my trust up and it being burnt and, and therefore not wanting and, and kind of walking away from it going, I, I didn't enjoy doing something I didn't want to do. I felt like I was pushed into a corner. Um, so yeah, I think, I think one thing that I would like to get better at is bringing people in to help develop my product, my brand, what I want to do in the future. Um, but yeah, it does take a lot because I, I've been burnt massively in the past and still to this very day getting burnt. I mean, you, you talk you talk about being burnt, having st stories sold, etc. How, how how did you deal with getting over that at the time? And I mean, you know, what would, what's your advice to you know to, to people who are maybe j just getting into the public eye in in, in, in today's world and, uh, and and suffering those kind of problems? Yeah, I think um, oh, I think I think you've got a very different world now. Back in the day when um, I got into the band, the the media pretty much did what the hell they wanted to do. Um, they were allowed to get away with so much in, in print, um, the papers. Um, now they can't that much, you know, back in the day I was phone hacked. Um, now you can't do that. There's laws against it. I think the law changes very quickly on that side of things. Um, so they can't do as much, but then you have social media that can be a ruin as well. Um, so it's, it's a very, very different world. Um, so I think anybody kind of getting into the industry, I think you've got to kind of know that you're willing to play the game. You can't have a slice of the cake and not take on the rest of it. I think you go out there knowing how you want your brand to be in five years time, what your goal is with your brand, um, because you are playing with fire. So you will have the crap that comes with it, you've just got to manipulate it to what the end goal is for you. So for example, if you are going into the media because you want to, you know, be a successful pop singer, 
Do you want to have a fashion brand off the side of it? Do you want to set up your own charity foundation? Do you want to, you know, have a makeup range or do you want to eventually have five years in the industry of being a pop star and then you want to go into movies? You've really got to know your game and play it as well as you can um, with the media to, to get as much as you can from it. And you've got to be thick skinned. You've got to be okay with people trolling you and tell and the papers um you know uh, slagging off your brand basically you've got to be okay with that how, how long did it take you to get okay with it uh still 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 now. still, still, yeah. still, 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 still struggle you know i put anything out on social media i think I'm, I'm much better than i was but i think you know what I, you always look at that one bad comment and forget the hundreds that are amazing. You'll have a hundred amazing comments on a post and there'll be one bad comment and that will stick with you. You'll wake up the next morning going, shall I reply to that or shall I say nothing? And it'll stick with you until you post something else and then that will be forgotten and then there'll be a couple of bad posts or there might be nothing. So it's, it's, it's just always going to be there. I think it's just getting, the more you do something, the more you get used to it. And what does the future hold then? What, what, what can we what can we hear well, from here in the next 19, 20 years? Well, who knows? I mean, I think for me, you know, I'm doing a lot in wellness now. Um, I uh, t t t Tell me about it. Yeah, so, um, so basically um, this year I've made some huge lifestyle changes. I've quit drinking. Um, I meditate. I've taken up running. Um, so everything for me is all in fitness and wellness. And as much as I love the, the theatre industry, it's got a long, a long time to recover, I think. When you say quit drinking, in completely teetotal yeah yeah gone sober so were, were, were you a bit were you a big drinker before or? no um yeah I, I i probably had like most people out there a, just an unhealthy relationship with alcohol i feel like it's something that as certainly the british culture you know we we kind of either binge drink or we're always drinking because we're stressed or we're celebrating something and i just found it it was really getting to my mental health and my anxiety. And I wanted to create, you know, good things for my future, create a good business um, and grow um, rather than it being the enemy. It was always being the thing that that prevented my confidence to kind of move on to the next level. So I thought, you know what, I'm quitting this. I'm doing the one year no beer challenge. So I'm currently eight months into it and okay. I'm feeling absolutely incredible. And I've started to talk about it as well. So yeah, I've started to do a lot more in wellness, chatting to um, lots of different brands that I'm collaborating with, um, particularly in the no alcohol sector and, you know, become, kind of growing my brand in running, in the running community. Um, so I've taken on some challenges this year, doing my first marathon. Um, yeah, so. And are, you, are you looking to have a product in the space, do you think, or yeah, you collaborate with other brands? Yeah, I am. Um, I think because, you know, it's funny, I've spent 20 years in this business being an entertainer. I've done five minutes in the wellness sector. I'm getting more traction than I ever have. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it's something that I really, really love doing. I love talking openly about my battles with mental health. Um, I love talking openly about my alcohol-free journey and how I've combated, um, you know, the the times of being out uh, in a social environment and not drinking. I just I just find that subject matter really, really interesting because like I said, I'm, I wasn't a raging alcoholic or had to stop or go to AA. It was just, just wanted to change my life and for me to not depend on something that is such a social thing for us Brits to do. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about more about that, work in that space um, and, you know, really kind of start a new brand almost and do it in the way that I almost should have done it as an entertainer. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to lots of collaborations in, in the, the wellness and, and lifestyle sector. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. And ju ju just before we go, g give the guys at home listening and watching a, a little, uh, where, where can they find you? Where, where can they follow you for this um, new stuff? I am at Susie underscore Shaw on Instagram. Um, keep an eye out. My website will be coming soon, which is suzanneshaw.co.uk. Um, and yeah. They'll keep us, uh, an eye out for all, all the new things that will be coming out. Perfect. Well, I'll I'll I'll, ch I'll check out your uh, check out your no drinking and no and, and your run running challenges. I'm I've just signed up to climb up Kilimanjaro in about four in about four weeks oh, time. Oh my god, so. we just signed up to do um uh, uh, Everest Base Camp. Oh really? Yeah. So just uh, pay for that. How, how long does it take to get there? 
don't know. I think uh, I think you do it for two weeks. Oh, really? Okay, yes. Yeah. So I, I fly on the 30th of September. Oh, amazing. And it's until the 10th of October. Oh, let me know how that goes. It's, it's I'm good. desperate to do it. <laughs> but, uh, I, I struggle to climb up a flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 Have you started training? I've been for a couple of walks and I've bought some boots. Oh, uh, right, okay. Good start, though. <laughs> That's I'm, a good start, yeah. Yeah, I, I, need to, I need to put some effort in over the next yeah. few weeks. Oh, you'll but love it. I'll tell you all about it. You can yeah. follow my progress. <laughs> yes, I will do. I will. Thanks. <laughs> Guys, I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed talking to Suzanne. If you like the video or you like the podcast, press like. And if you haven't subscribed before, subscribe so you can see more great guests like Suzanne and loads more entertaining and inspiring stories. So I'll see you next time on the show. Thank you very much.